I have. Thank you so much, Hanno, and thank you everybody uh, for joining today. I'm actually talking to you today from uh, Thailand. I'm on holiday with my family, and uh, I thought that, um, that they would be disappointed that I had to do some work during our holiday, but my wife and nine-year-old daughter have gone off shopping with my credit card, and they had no problem with me giving a talk today. So I'm dreading what I will see when I finish and what they come back with. Uh, but in any case, for now, uh, it's my pleasure to share with you uh, quite a significant piece of work that we did uh, on the role of technology. We actually did a position paper for OUP uh, together with two wonderful colleagues uh, who some of you may know, Gavin Dudeney and Martin Lamb. Um, and uh, this was a position paper that we did for Oxford University Press. And we essentially tried to synthesize, you know, 50, 60 years of, of research and best practices in the area of educational technology, of course, especially looking at our experiences in the last two to three years. So trying to summarize all of that in the next 20, 25 minutes is going to be uh, a somewhat tall order, but I will do my best. So this area of educational technology, I think, is one of the most fascinating in the educational space because on the one hand, there's been so many exciting promises and there still is so much innovation, so many new ideas that are kind of emerging. But the history of educational technology, as I'm sure you all know, is also full of catastrophes and absolutely unbelievable failures. Um, the one that always seems to come to mind, especially for those of us that have been around the block a few times, is the old language laboratory, you know, where learners had to, you know, sit and study for hours and do exercises very mechanically and, you know, based on behavioristic principles and drill and practice. And, well, the experience uh, that we had at the time was that technology can clearly uh, also be... Um, not beneficial and that in fact in as, as the research at the time showed can have a, uh, a demotivational impact as well in the long term now luckily of course in our field we never make the same mistake twice we always learn from our experiences right so we never do something like we did in the last two years <laughs> uh, but of course you know this is the thing about technology um, it often presents itself as a solution at a time of need. Um, and we, you know, we grasp at it in the hope and the expectation that it will provide a solution. But especially in situations uh, where there's a lot of pressure on us or change or in the case of the pandemic, you know, we just don't have the, the time or the wherewithal to start from a pedagogical point of view. So essentially what we realized when we started on this position paper was we need to go back to basics. We need to really start from the most, you know, elementary question before we even look at the technology, and that is, you know, what motivates our learners? And the first kind of very clear conclusion, if you will, is very obvious, but it's still worth remembering, and that is that technology in and of itself does not motivate learners, right? Um, it can temporarily <clears throat> create excitement. It can act as, a, as an instigator of, of a, a sense of you know, adventure, perhaps, and maybe kickstart some degree of motivation. But in and of itself, the technology, as is very clear from the literature, doesn't motivate learners. But it does provide opportunities. It does create conditions, or it can help to create the kinds of conditions that may lead to motivation emerging. And that's, of course, the exciting part. In a 20-minute presentation, one, one element that I don't really have time to go into, but I wanted to put it up here because I'll share the, the presentation with you later so you can look this up, is a model called METUX that some of you may have heard of. And that essentially tries to uh, present a holistic view of how motivation, engagement, and this notion of thriving, you know, really having an experience of flow and, and in education, uh, how this operates in practice. And I'll show it to you, one, as a, as a reference to follow up on later if you're interested, and two, because it was a, a, one of the starting points for our uh, position paper. And I'm going to kind of go into the, the motivation theory behind it uh, as opposed to the model itself, which can become a little bit theoretical for a short presentation. 
What I've also done is create for you, put together a toolkit, for want of a better name, with suggestions and ideas um, based on this research synthesis. And these are essentially you know, heuristics, you know, ideas, suggestions, things to keep in mind when you're developing materials or designing a curriculum, etc. So uh, for some of the examples that I will give that we don't have time to go into detail for, uh, I refer you to, to the link uh, behind me. Maybe one of the organizers can put it into the chat window as well. It's innovationandteaching.org and then a forward slash edtech.php. I'll put it up again uh, later. Um, but the key point that uh, I wanted to share with you today is this notion of uh, self-determination theory and its relation to technology. And as probably many of you will be aware, self-determination theory posits that for motivation to, to emerge, three basic conditions have to be met. And these three conditions are and have been demonstrated to be really universal. So whether it's younger learners, older learners, um, girls or boys, different countries, different cultures, um, sometimes in slightly varying degrees, but all of us have a, a need to have our sense of autonomy uh, met, meaning that we want to feel that we are in charge of of our lives, and that includes, of course, also our education, that we have some responsibility uh, and that we're able to manage our learning. Um, we also all have a desire for relatedness. This is the social aspect of learning. We want to feel connected to other people, whether it's teachers or learners or parents, community, etc. And finally, we want to feel that we are able to achieve things. We want to experience a sense of competence. Now applied to technology, that suddenly makes that initial question, what motivates learners, a little bit more specific. Because now you can ask yourself in any given situation or when looking at any type of technology that might you know, come across your desk, um, whether that particular solution actually helps to foster in your learners this sense of autonomy, relatedness, and competence, and maybe it's one of those, maybe it's all three, and you know this now opens the door to ask yourself to what extent a new technology does that, and whether it can do it in a way that is better than what you were doing before. And that leads to a very simple but very important insight, which is that if a particular technology does not actually help to improve that, if it does not contribute to relatedness, autonomy, and or competence, Maybe it shouldn't be used at all, right? We often have this idea that if a technology is available, we somehow have to find a use for it. You know, the interactive whiteboard is an example that comes to mind. Tablets, you know, sometimes great use can be found for them, but you have to be clear on the motivational principles that you're trying to achieve first. And it's such an obvious point to put on, on, on the screen, but in, in our research synthesis, something that came out very clearly was that in many cases where it should have been obvious to participants and stakeholders that the technology wasn't actually delivering something new or additional, uh, it still was held on to often long past its uh, sell-by date. Now, on a more positive note, what we have also very clearly found is that um, learner training, you know, any kind of support that you provide to learners can actually make a huge impact on helping learners to use the technology in such a way that it can foster their autonomy, relatedness, and competence. So what we do with and for our learners around the use of their technology, whether it's the technology that we use in class or whether it's the technology that learners use themselves, actually can have uh, sometimes an even bigger impact than the technology itself. And that is a, a really you know, positive uh, insight. Um, unfortunately, in a 20 minute presentation, I don't have the time to go into the topic on the screen behind me here, but I wanted to put it up because I just wanted to flag it as, a, as an emerging area uh, that I think we're going to see more of in the years to come. Um, did a podcast um, the other day with Aga Palalas on this topic. Mark Pegram from Australia uh, has written and talked about this a lot as well. Uh, but it's the idea that actually 
not only do we need to think about technology as, as something that uh, can, can harm and that we have to you know, think about ways to avoid you know, issues around security and privacy, et cetera, all of which is important, but that we also can consider technology from a positive point of view and ask ourselves, how can technology be used for improving learners' well-being, learners' digital well-being? And to give you a really, really small example, if you wear a Fitbit or something like that, that can have a positive benefit on your health, on your physical health. It can have a positive influence on your digital well-being. And the same is being considered also now in the area slightly and, and slowly and more and more uh, in the area of education. And, and a related term that I really like is this notion of, of positive computing, you know, dedicating an entire field to coming up with ideas for designing and developing uh, technology that supports human well-being and human potential. And kind of as, as teachers, as language teachers, language educators, that's sort of what we do, what we do anyway, right, um, in, in our classes when we engage with our learners. And it's nice to be reminded that actually technology can help us to achieve that sometimes in new uh, and interesting ways. Um, looking at some of the, the characteristics of the, uh, the three components, relatedness, autonomy, and, and competence. Um, one thing that we found very clearly from our synthesis was that um, there are things that have been demonstrated, sometimes through extensive, you know, longitudinal, uh, very large-scale studies or qualitative studies uh, in different contexts, different cultures, to really impact uh, the different components of motivation in education. So, for example, um, the topic of relatedness, um, providing learners with opportunities um, for supporting others, uh, you know, working together, creating communities, you know, putting learners together into, into groups, um, supporting a sense of, of warmth and goodwill in, in that community. These are examples of, of activities, actions that as teachers we can engage in that have been demonstrated to have a direct impact on that notion of relatedness and therefore on learners' long-term motivation. Um, all of these, these cards, I've put them together in, uh, in the toolkit, are available for you to have a look at later. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're all based on, on existing studies. So they're kind of, if you will, um, a combination of, of or, or, or a summation of, of best practices. Um, similarly, we can learn what works, but we can also look at existing studies and teachers' experiences to identify what we know doesn't work. Um, any kind of community, any kind of technology that alienates learners, anything that disconnects learners from their communities rather than brings learners together is likely to lead to um, relatedness, the sense of relatedness being frustrated and therefore motivation not emerging. And of course, in our field, uh, we, all, we all sort of intuitively know this, right? We've talked about the affective turn in language education for almost a decade now, maybe longer, uh, but Anna Pavlenko, of course, was one of the first ones to use the term. This, this notion that we can't just teach the content and it's not enough to just provide social opportunities for engagement and interaction, but we actually have to think about not just what goes on learners' heads, but also what goes on in their hearts and how we can bring that into the educational experience and you know that's as simple as as asking learners you know how they're doing and, and showing showing uh, showing a genuine interest in in learners and you know technology does offer a lot of opportunities a lot of ways for us to to do that to ask questions like how are you doing where are you how's it going you know what do you care about what communities are you a part of um, as one Example of that, uh, back-channeling, uh, you know, a technique to basically provide learners with uh, a, a communication channel uh, outside of the traditional, you know, face-to-face, in-class, teacher asks a question, learner answers the question, really can be very empowering for learners because suddenly using, you know, whether it's any of these tools at the bottom of the screen here, Kahoot or Padlet or, you know, Yo Teach or, you know, any of the hundreds of applications that's out there are don't really have any preference for them. But what they have in common is that suddenly the communication is no longer just vertical. It's no longer just from top to bottom and occasionally from bottom to top, but it's now also horizontal. It's now also 
from one learner to another. And in many cases, it extends beyond the classroom, maybe from a learner to, uh, who's outside the classroom to a teacher in a school or from a teacher to a parent. And uh, that, as I said, is very empowering, especially for learners who, for whatever reason, uh, don't have a, a strong voice, right? And if you're teaching lower proficiency learners, uh, you know how hard it is for learners to ask a question in uh, a second language, and especially for learners who lack the confidence, you know, the, the risk of, of making a mistake and looking silly uh, are suddenly reduced quite greatly if you can type your question or if you can see that other people post the same question as you. So you're not the dumb kid in class. Everybody else is also wondering what this crazy teacher is going on about. So that's a really good example of, of uh, encouraging relatedness with the use of technology. Another is just simply to invite stories. Um, storytelling, of course, and digital storytelling in particular are such powerful tools of not just sharing information, but also learning about others, right? We, we learn from, as, as kids, as babies, we, we acculturate into our communities through stories. And as we grow older, stories sort of disappear a little bit. Uh, but yeah, again, technology provides fantastic opportunities, especially for um, lower level learners uh, to, to, to express themselves and to share who they are, what they like, what they care about, etc. Um, you know, and, and tools like Powtoon and Animator, and again, there's, there's dozens of them, allow learners to create their stories, not just using their, their underdeveloped language, but also using animations, using images, video, uh, anime, what have you. And again, it can be very uh, empowering for, for learners. This idea of, you know, basically finding ways for learners to share their voices, to be heard, in as many different ways as possible, including through uh, connecting them with different communities. And of course, that's where social media, if used wisely, can have a very, very powerful impact. Um, briefly, what I want to also emphasize is that um, when we talk about uh, the use of technology in education, of course, we also have to consider how that relates to the use of technology outside of the formal realm. Um, there are many, many different types of spaces or environments in which learners uh, can and do learn both the language and other aspects uh, of, of the things that they, that they are, are studying. Um, without going through all of these in detail, you know, but in addition to the, the formal learning that takes place in, in, a, in a school, for example, uh, whether it's you know, through informal learning or mentor-based learning, uh, peer learning, self-directed learning, uh, game-based learning, community learning. There are dozens of types of different forms of learning possible, many of which have very little to do with the formal structured environment that we offer in, in a traditional classroom. And it's an exciting opportunity for us to look and see how as teachers we can first of all learn about what learners do in these different spaces and then secondly explore opportunities for connecting with what they do and, and provide opportunities for using uh, the language in those spaces. And that's all the more important because such a very, very large amount of adult learning takes place outside of formal education. Uh, if you think about it yourself, if you're, you know, stuck at work, you don't necessarily immediately go and enroll for another master's course or what have you, but you just talk to a colleague, you watch some YouTube videos, you observe someone more senior than you, and it's through that process that we learn. And well, that applies to uh, our learners, of course, as well. So <coughs> it's important to recognize that um, we have, of course, for many years known about and considered the topic of lifelong learning, you know, supporting learners for their future learning, but we also need to remember to support life-wide learning so that we provide opportunities and support for learners as they are currently operating in different spaces across their personal lives. Um, again, uh, we have synthesized the research on, well, what are some of the features of technology that contribute 
to autonomy? What are some of the things that we know um, actually support the development of learner autonomy? And it's things like you know, providing learners with meaningful choices, uh, giving learners a clear understanding of why you are doing what you're doing in class, you know, talking about the rationale. It's as simple as explaining to your learners why we're doing what we're doing today or why the textbook that we're using wants us to do the things uh, in this particular way. And that immediately translates into learners having a sense of, of agency, uh, and that's very, very powerful. Similarly, there are things that we know should be avoided. Um, any type of environment that is experienced by learners to be controlling or manipulative or intrusive uh, is likely to lead to demotivation. As I said, I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, all of them will be available to you, and uh, I encourage that you, uh, that you have a look at some of these resources. Um, one of them is another position paper by, um, I think it was Sarah Mercer and Nikki Hockley, if I remember correctly, on learner agency. So this topic of autonomy has been dealt with in a position paper uh, earlier with lots and lots of ideas, including uh, ideas for you know, activities that you can use in class. Um, and finally, you know, the same applies to this notion of competence, uh, helping learners to, you know, to using technology to improve, for example, the way that learners experience feedback, right? And you see this as a really good example in the use of uh, digital games, um, especially those not used for uh, formal purposes, where as a player, as a user, I'm constantly getting feedback, right? And it's constantly giving me ideas for what to do next. And the level that I'm operating at is always just, a, you know, it's never super, super easy. And it's never so hard that I can't achieve it. So I'm constantly being pushed to continue and I'm constantly getting cues and feedback. And well, there's a lot that we as language teachers can learn from those types of technology. Um, and so again, lots of research evidence, lots of ideas for things to, to look for, things to strive for, and things to avoid. The final thing I want to say, conscious of time, is that um, all of this, uh, and this is something that kind of really dawned on us as we went through this process of writing the paper, which took well over a year, was that this notion of learner training, of learners developing the skills necessary to operate different spaces, to you know, make their own choices, to you know, have, have um, a genuine understanding of what goes on in class, for example, the rationale that we discussed, requires learners to have a number of skills. Right? It requires learners to have some competencies around managing their own learning. And what we saw in the literature, and certainly from my own experience, I've seen this many times, I'm guilty of it myself, is asking learners to do things with good intentions, um, trying to make them more autonomous, et cetera, without providing uh, the, the extensive support and the longitudinal uh, learner development that is necessary for that to be possible. And um, a few years ago, it's, I think it's 10 years ago now, I put together a, uh, a model framework for self directed learning or life-wide learning. And starting at nine o'clock, you can see it starts from helping learners, giving learners ideas about how they can identify their own learning needs, how they can set their own goals, how they can plan their learning, you know, how, how, to, how to draw up a good plan, a smart, um, a set, a set smart goals and draw up a good plan. But also things like how to, how to monitor your own progress. I mean, how as a learner can you figure out by yourself whether an activity is actually helping you rather than uh, waiting for a teacher to, to tell you. Um, Self-assessment and, and revision, you know, making new decisions about your own plans. And the good news is that all of these skills can be individually taught and have a very positive impact on uh, our learners. But of course, all of that depends on us kind of being willing to take a little bit of risk and um, try out these, these new technologies and being, being willing and, and, and confident enough to say, no, we don't need this technology uh, until we can figure out if it can help us to achieve, for example, increased relatedness or increased competence or increased autonomy. Or we're not going to use 
a particular technology until our learners are actually ready, have built up the skills, the confidence, uh, etc., uh, and have the, the kind of right attitude towards learning and their own agency uh, before we let them loose on, I don't know, social media or digital games. So in other words, the picture is, is complex, but at the same time, it's also quite simple. Simple, but not easy. And it's simple in the sense that uh, good learning outcomes uh, with technology still very, very much, of course, depend on, on you, on us, um, making good pedagogical choices and then considering whether the technology can help us to achieve those pedagogical outcomes in a better way. Um, as I said, the, uh, the toolkit is available for you online. Also, the slides that I just shared, so there's a lot of references on there if you want to look them up later, but definitely have a look at the, at the toolkit. Uh, innovation and teaching .org is just my personal uh, website. Have a look there. There's lots of resources on there. You can contact me through there as well. If you want to go straight to the additional resources, just add the forward slash edtech.php. And uh, thank you all for, for listening. Uh, and thank you again, Heno and colleagues, Sophie and the others for, for inviting me. Fantastic. <clears throat> thank you very much, Haya. Wow, what a wonderful whirlwind tour of the world of uh, motivation. Um, really good. And I really like that, that final focus on um, life-wide learning. You know, we've, we've spoken a lot about lifelong learning, but life-wide learning, it's, it's, it's a really interesting concept. Um, and, you know, uh, leading with, with the autonomy and competency and relatedness and, and finding the technology then that suits that and not the other way around. I think it's a really nice way of, of framing it. Um, I don't think we have too many questions in the Q&A, but the chat was uh, buzzing around your setup that you got there. I don't know if you can quickly let them know how you set up your, uh, your screen and your technology in such a way that's, that it looks like you're on stage. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm using a free program in the background called OBS. Uh, it stands for Open Broadcasting System, I think it is. Uh, so OBS, if you Google it, you'll find it. It's free, and it's a very powerful piece of software. You can create really, really nice uh, presentations. So I've got a very small green screen with me uh, that I travel with, that I roll up, and then I've got a good camera, DSLR, that's kind of five meters away from me so that it can actually capture the whole of me rather than just a webcam on my, my face. So it's, it's not uncomplicated, but it's also not... Uh, not that difficult to figure out. Um, if you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out to me through any of these, these channels. Okay.